Welcome to the Eternity Online Service. Great to have you with us today. This is the day for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're excited. We're ready to praise God. We're going to pray with you, share the Word of God together, and receive all that God has for you and for us today. Let's praise Him together right now as we sing.
Praise is always the right thing to do. No matter what circumstance you're in, it's always right to praise the Lord. We've just been praising Him with songs. We can thank Him and praise Him as we pray for each other today. And we want to pray for you. So let's pray. God loves you. Father, we just pray that you would come by the power of your Spirit and touch people's hearts. Lord, that their needs would be met today. Lord, we thank you that you're our healer, you are a provider, and I thank you that you are the one that gives us peace. I'm praying for somebody right now who's been having very anxious thoughts at night time. And in Jesus' name, I stand against all of that anxiety, the negative thoughts, the things that try to disturb your peace, the things that are trying to steal from you and rob from you. And I pray today, Father, that you would give this person the resolve and the strength of heart by the grace of God to keep their mouth and their confessions pure and to cast all of their cares over onto you and to not be distracted by this. And in Jesus' name, we bind up all that anxiety, the attacks of worry and concern, and we shut it down in Jesus' name and we release the peace of God and we thank you for your promise that you give your beloved sleep in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying for someone that you just feel like you've got aches and pains all over. You just mm. just don't feel good. Father, I pray for those aches and pains to go in the name of Jesus. Father, I declare healing and thank you for it now in Jesus' name. I'm praying for somebody and you've had a, like an accident in the backyard or in around the home and you've fallen down and you've hit your elbow and it's cracked a bone in there and it's not very comfortable you know it's not like a major sort of surgically required break but it is broken it's cracked and in the name of jesus i just declare over that elbow right now complete healing put your hand on the one that's damaged receive healing i feel the heat of god flowing into that situation right now bringing healing knitting bones back together and i command that knitting process to go forward and i bind up every bit of pain from around that the spirit of pain i bind you right now and i stand against this broken cracked bone in jesus name and claim complete healing for it right now in the name of the lord jesus christ of nazareth i pray for headaches right now those suffering with headaches i just declare healing in the name of jesus i command all the muscle tension to ease and to stop all that tension to ease off in the name of jesus headache goes now in the name of jesus thank you lord i don't know if this is part of the same situation or slightly different but somebody, you feel like there's a band right around your head, about that wide, and it goes right around. It's like a pressure, it's a tension, and it's causing that headache and that dull ache. And in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that compression band around your head right now. I command it to go, I loose it from you, and command it to leave out of there in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm praying for someone with a skin rash. I pray for that skin rash to clear up in the name of Jesus. Rash, disappear, Jesus' name. I'm praying for somebody today and you've been having trouble keeping your food down. It's a digestive thing and it could be because your stomach is just so nervous of the things that are going on and the pressures that your life's under. It's increased heating bills, all kinds of other challenges. And in Jesus' name, I stand against that disorder, the digestion, and I just claim right now, Father, that our bread and our water is blessed. You've taken sickness away from the midst of us. You said that we can cast all the care on you. And you said that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And I pray for this person right now, a settled stomach, peace, able to eat and digest their food and enjoy it and assimilate it into their body as nutrition in Jesus' name. Yeah, and I pray for everyone with financial pressure. I just declare that God is your provider and father we just declare that provision coming in supernaturally or just some way that every bill is paid every need is met in the name of jesus father we give you all the praise and the thanks today and we thank you lord that you're with us you're guiding us you've been with us the whole time and you've given to each one of us and we praise you that today's cares and anxieties are enough for each day and we refuse to worry about tomorrow 
or for what's coming ahead because father you have that in your hands you have it under control and you said keep your eyes on jesus and you won't sink in the storm and keep your eyes on jesus the author and a perfecter of your faith and this day father we roll all of the cares over onto you all of the worries all of the anxieties and we thank you lord that you're guiding each one of us in jesus name so as we continue to worship god just open your heart and continue to receive from him what he has for you right now. This is the day. This is the we will display resurrection power Moving by faith, we will see His glory Revealing the way, salvation story Produces purpose. Most of us go through pain as we progress toward our purpose. We don't often understand it as we would hope to cruise through life a little easier than we do.
every piece of the puzzle of our life has a purpose. Every piece is necessary, even the painful pieces. When the whole picture comes together, somehow it all fits together. In isolation, it doesn't seem to make sense. And all we feel is the pain of the situation. Even in the painful times, the lonely, isolated times, although we may not understand these times, we have to believe that in the end, it will all work together for good, for your good. What we do in our times of pain is the thing that will make the difference. Pain will change us. It will change you. The question is whether it will change us for good or for bad. A situation will either make us bitter or better. That's why the Bible encourages us in the book of Philippians to focus on whatever is good in a situation. Whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I personally don't believe that God wants us to suffer pain, but he does show us how to get through the pain. There is always something good that comes out of a bad situation. We can come through the other end stronger, with a greater confidence in God, even if we don't fully understand why we had to go through a situation. We must guard against coming out defeated and giving up on our dreams. We can turn the pain into a new passion. Be determined to grow through the pain, not just go through it. I remember praying in the hospital for my brother who was dying after being hit by a train while driving his truck when it was evident that his life would be cut short and he would not survive, I decided to be more determined to win people to Christ. His share as well as mine. It was just a fresh passion to turn the pain into purpose. Now, it may not have been rational, but it did reignite passion on the inside. Every struggle makes us stronger. You build muscle when you are in a fight. We are not created to just cruise through life. We live in a fallen world. We have an enemy on this earth and we must learn to fight. We are in a war. You are armed with strength for every battle you face. God is getting you prepared for the next level of your destiny. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are well able to fight every fight you face. Ultimately, there is purpose for every bit of pain that you face. We may never understand the reason for it, but we have to believe that all things work together 
for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Even in suffering and hardship, even in bitter disappointment, or if you have been treated wrongly, God will work in your situation to fulfill His good purpose in your life. Count it all joy, knowing that the pain will eventually lead to your gain. Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises, he hears faith. There is a sound. I love to hear it's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. There is a sound that changes things, the sound of his people on their knees. Wake up, you slumbering, it's time to worship him. Praise the Lord. Sing His praise the Lord. 
Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. The Law of Confession. This is part three this week, and we're talking about Bible examples of the Law of Confession in operation. First, I'll read the four basic scriptures that are the foundation for this whole series. In Mark 11, 23, he gave some conditions first, but Jesus said he will have whatever he says. Job 6, 25, how forceful are right words. Proverbs 18, 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. James 3, 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Let's pray. Father, as we look into this today, and we're asking for your spirit of wisdom and revelation, to enable us to see what you're showing us in your word, and then to be able to apply it in our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we've been on this series now for three weeks, and so far we've learned about what Jesus taught about the law of confession, there in Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, etc. Then we looked at the Holy Spirit expanding and elaborating on that. The way he described it in the book of James is so important. As I read that scripture there that says, if anyone doesn't stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. And that scripture goes on to give several illustrations of what the tongue can do. First illustration is that it's like the bit in a horse's mouth, which you pull on, putting pressure on the tongue and the side of the mouth, and that turns the whole horse's body with relatively little input from the rider. The second illustration is like the rudder on a ship. There's a helmsman. The captain sets the direction he wants to go. He turns the wheel something or the steering wheel. It controls the rudder at the back of the ship. Maybe different in the super modern ships, but that's the way it has been for centuries. And when that rudder turns, initially the boat doesn't change direction. But if that rudder maintains its input, it starts to force the back of the ship around and eventually the whole vessel with the captain, the helmsman, all the passengers and cargo start going in the direction set by the captain. And that shows the power of our tongue. Our tongue, if it's set in the right direction, will bring our life and all those for whom we are responsible into the direction that God wants. Amen. He also said the tongue is like kindling a fire. And when a match starts a fire that leads to a forest fire, it can do a lot of damage without anybody ever being able to find any remnants of the originator of the fire, which is the little tiny match or a piece of kindling. And it's the same with our life. Our tongue can cause a lot of trouble. It can cause burning trouble in churches, in homes, in families, in lives, in businesses, in workplaces. But when the whole thing's over, it would be very hard to trace it back to the tongue. But God's revealing to us that the tongue is the problem. He also said the tongue is harder to tame than a wild animal. Through James, the Holy Spirit said many wild animals have been tamed, all of them really, by mankind. However, no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly fire, and it's set on fire by hell. No man can tame the tongue, but that doesn't mean it can't be tamed. It just can't be tamed by our willpower. But when we rely on God's power, the tongue can most certainly be tamed and used to set the life in the right direction. James also gives the illustration of the fountain. He said a fountain can't send forth both sweet water and bitter from the same opening. And so if our tongue is used and our mouth is used as the opening of two sources of words, one's bringing blessing and the other one's bringing cursing, 
we find that they mix together at the faucet, so to speak. When they come out, it's a mixture of sweet and bitter, therefore it's not pure water. And that's the whole point of that. It's impossible to have this mixture come out and for it to be of benefit to God. We need to purify our hearts because out of the abundance or overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we need to yield our tongue to the Holy Spirit because he can tame the tongue and soak in the living word of God. So we need to be meditating in the word, eating the word, thinking about the word, studying the word of God, keeping it going in day and night. We need to think about God's goodness, his love, his character, his faithfulness, and mix all of these meditations constantly. And then the overflow of our heart can be the pure word of God, and thus our tongue is tamed. And we can visit with God in the spirit, and we can see what he's showing us, and we can speak in line with those things. And this also leads to pure water coming from the fountain out of the spigot of our life, which is our mouth, using our tongue to set our life in a good direction and to set up circumstances for those who travel on our ship. Amen. Then the third time we looked at this, which has been over two parts, we looked at God's priorities for spoken words. And we saw that God's first use of spoken words falls under the law of first mention. Wherever in the Bible something is mentioned for the first time, God has used that as a way to set up in our thinking his intended use of that or his intended way to view that particular issue, item, or whatever it is. So the first use of God's spoken words was not to describe something, was not to communicate, was not to complain or whinge. He didn't use his first spoken words to justify himself. He didn't use it to teach anything. He used the first use of spoken words to change the prevailing situation. So the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was or became without form. It was a void and it was dark. So it was a dark, formless, void. But when God spoke, he didn't say, wow, what a dark, formless void. What am I going to do? He didn't say, what a dark, formless void. Well, this is because. He didn't say, what a dark, formless void. The enemies put me in this time. He spoke his words as his number one priority to change it. When he saw the dark, empty, formless void, he said, let there be light and everything changed. He kept repeating the let there be statements and his second type of spoken words were words of blessing, be fruitful, multiply, fill. And then to man, he added the part about take dominion and subdue. And so the priorities went on and on. We've looked at that in the last couple of weeks. But today we're looking at some Bible examples of the law of confession operating. We're going to look at David Elijah, Elisha, and Jesus. And I think it's a good idea for us to start with a very simple illustration from the Old Testament. It's the 12 spies. Now, after God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them through the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his military were completely annihilated and were never again a threat to God's people. They were in the wilderness for a few months and they crossed over via Mount Sinai. You know, the water coming out of the rock, the manna coming from heaven, some squabbles and issues they brought up. Finally, they got to the brink of the promised land. It didn't take all that long compared with the 40 years they were there. The first time they got there, God told Moses, you choose 12 men out of the 12 tribes, one from each tribe. They are leaders. They were recognized. They were officially appointed, chosen, underlined, if you like. It was God's idea, and Moses sent them with a commission. Go and look at the promised land and report to us what it's like, and report to us the current inhabitants and bring us some samples of the fruit. So the 12 spies went there, and they looked around, and they brought back some pomegranates and some grapes, and a great report of the land. And all 12 of them agreed 
on certain things. They agreed the land was good. God's future for his people is good. And these 12 spies are like 12 prophets today. They've been given a gift. They've been given a platform. They've been specially chosen, anointed, appointed, commissioned to see the future God has for his people and to come back and to bring a word of encouragement and inspiration, motivation, imparting the grace to fight for it. So the 12 spies in the original story came back. They all agreed it was good. They even agreed that there's giants in the land. Caleb got up and he said, and we can take it now. God can cause us to have victory. 10 out of the 12 said, we can't take it. We are grasshoppers. They are giants. We are doomed. And even though they were the right people with the right call and the right gift, they spread a negative report and they used their tongue to communicate not only God's future, but their own fears, their own insecurities, their own fleshly concepts and perceptions. And they spread that among the people. And they ended up, instead of preaching faith, they preached doubt, unbelief and fear and turn the heart of a whole generation away from God's plan. Caleb and Joshua, on the other hand, two out of 12, see it's less than 20% of the prophets, actually spoke what they saw and then spoke God's heart. We can do it. We can do it now. We can take it. Sadly, the majority agreed with the 10 spies who prophesied doubt and unbelief along with the vision of the future. They then wandered for 40 years and they said it would be better for us to die in the wilderness. But all 12 spies got exactly what they said. The 10 who said we can't take it, didn't take it. They said we'd be better off dying in the wilderness and they did. That's exactly what they got, was exactly what they said. The two spies who said it's good, yes, there's giants and there's walled cities, but under God's power we can take it. They got what they said, even though the influence of the other 10 caused a 40 year delay. But these two, Joshua and Caleb, stuck to their confession. They stuck to what they believed. And eventually Joshua led them in. And after they'd had some skirmishes and some battles, then Caleb said, give me the mountain. And I know it was full of giants, but Caleb went up there and he evicted those squatting giants, kicked them right out. And he took over what God had promised to him because he operated the law of confession. And even though he was 85 years old when he got to take his mountain, he still did because the law of confession works. You can have what you say and don't let anybody else talk you out of it. They'll have what they say, but you will have what you say. You don't have to have what they say. And they won't have what you say, but you say what God says, what God shows you. Speak words of faith, speak that which edifies and builds others up, and you can have what you say. It's a law. That means it works the same every time. Jesus said, if you do not doubt in your heart and you believe that what you say is coming to pass, you will have whatsoever you say. It's a law. And if you can bridle your tongue, you can bridle your whole body. It can set the direction for your life. It can set things on fire for God, not in a destructive way. And if it's coming out of a pure heart, this is the words that God said, I watch over my word to perform it and he will perform it. It's like the rain that comes down from heaven. It will not return to him void, but it will accomplish what he sent it to do. You can have what you say. So our first example today is David. What can we learn from Bible examples of the law of confession in operation? Number one, David, your words can build a highway of holiness. This is such a great example of the law of confession. We really need to take this in and learn from it. Amen. So here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 41 to 44, Goliath faced off to David, and I'm sure most of you know the background of this story. The two armies came together. It was kind of like an old-fashioned tradition. They put out their best warrior 
you put out your best warrior, whoever wins, wins and it saves everybody else's life. So nobody was going to go against the giant, which was a bit of a leftover from Caleb and Joshua's day, except David, an inexperienced soldier, a 17-year-old shepherd boy, approximately, who was simply bringing supplies to his brothers. He didn't even have a sword, but he went out as the mighty warrior of Israel to face off against the giant. Let's read what happened, because we really have to see exactly what God's word says here. 1 Samuel 17, 41 to 44. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you would come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. So it was a war of words a long time before it was a physical war. David responded with his own words. You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and take your head from you. Yeah, think about it. This is big words from an inexperienced boy who hasn't even got a sword. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So this began, obviously, first with preparation in the word and the spirit. And let's think about this. David was originally a shepherd boy, perhaps the youngest in his family. And then one day Samuel turned up after God rejected Saul from being king. He came there supposedly to make a sacrifice, but he was really looking for the king God had chosen to anoint to replace Saul. And so all of David's brothers came before Samuel, but he didn't find among them the one God was anointing. Then Samuel asked David's father, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. And Samuel then, it says in verse 13, Samuel took his flask of oil and anointed him, with his brothers standing around watching. The Spirit of God entered David like a rush of wind, God vitally empowering him for the rest of his life. I really love this translation of this. God vitally empowered him for the rest of his life. This was the theme to some of the camps we ran when I was in the principal of the Bible college. The first thing is that there is a preparation. So David had the Spirit of God, and he also, according to Psalm 1, was meditating in the Word of God. And in Psalm 23, he said, The Lord is my shepherd. So David knew that when he was out looking after the sheep, God was his shepherd. He had the Spirit of God leading him, showing him things, so that by the time he turned up to face Goliath, he had God overflowing from his heart. He had God's faith, God's word, God's character. He knew God was with him. He knew he had a covenant and he certainly knew he had the spirit of God on him. And so that's why it began with a war of words. And you think about it, Goliath spoke first, speaking by the devil's inspiration. Come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, under normal circumstances, you think about this, a giant, experienced man of war who's been living this war lifestyle since he was a boy is facing a shepherd and he speaks by his God, but he only says he can take out an unarmed boy, except for a cup of rocks and a stick. He doesn't speak that big by his God. Then we hear David speak. And if you didn't know this story and you were listening to a boy, He's a teenager, probably, who appears to be unarmed, 
doesn't have a shield, doesn't have armor. Mouthing off these words at a giant experienced warrior, you'd think this guy's lost his biscuits. This guy is so arrogant and grandiose, I think he's on hopium, not the truth. But he was speaking by God. So David, even though smaller, younger, and comparably inexperienced, spoke by the infinite spirit of the living God. Let's read this in the New King James. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I'll strike you and take your head from you. And this day, now listen to what David says in comparison to Goliath. Goliath says, I'm going to kill a teenage boy who doesn't even have a sword or a shield. And this is what David says in the face of a giant and a whole army of people with swords, shields, and armor and experience. This day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there's a God in Israel. Amen. What an amazing statement. But you see, the law of confession comes into play. What David said came from the overflow of his heart because of his preparation, his love for God and his Holy Spirit lifestyle. So those words are words God watches over to perform. The first thing that happened that day was David ran at the giant. He had picked up five stones. He did a slingshot. That was the weapon he was used to. It hit poor old Goliath in the head, somehow got between his armor, hit him in the head. He fell down. Then David took out Goliath's sword and cut his head off. So David prevailed over the giant. But he had said, I'm not just going to feed you to the birds and the animals. I'm going to feed the whole army of the Philistines to the birds and the animals. And so there was a mighty victory that day from Israel. And then it doesn't end there. The words David spoke do something which I call building a highway of holiness. And I'm going to show the scripture for this so that you can see where I'm coming from. In Isaiah 35, 8 to 10, this is what God says through the prophet. A highway shall be there and a road. It shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed of the Lord shall walk there and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy in their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Amen. I believe what David spoke in the face of Goliath that day, when he spoke by God, that he not only declared what would happen that day to Goliath, but he built a highway of holiness for his future reign as king, and then on down through his descendants until the Philistines were completely annihilated and removed forever. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 25, and David became the king over all of Israel and Judah, and then suddenly the Philistines attacked him again, and this is what it says, and David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Giza. Then a few generations later under Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18.8, he subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from Watchtower to Fortified City. And then finally in Amos we read, And I'll cut off the inhabitants of Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon, and that's the towns of the Philistines, and I'll turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish. David spoke it. God watched over it to perform it on the day, then through David's life while he was reigning as king, and then through the life of his descendants until the Philistines were completely annihilated. And I know that today they've got the Palestinians living there, pretending they're the Philistines, and maybe they operate under the same spirit, but the original Philistines are gone. David spoke it, and the highway of holiness enabled him to live it for the rest of his life. See, the Spirit came on him, vitally empowering him for the rest of his life, and the Spirit gave him the words 
that would build the highway of holiness for him for the rest of our lives. And I want to encourage you today, you can take God's word into your heart and you can speak out confessions today that can set you up for your future. Amen. They can steer the horse in the right direction. They can get the ship going in the right direction. They can become pure fountain of living words that can be overwatched by God and he brings them to pass. Amen. This is what you can do by using the law of confession. But remember, it starts with purify your hearts, you double minded. And so David's slingshot where the stone sunk into Goliath's head is a picture for us of the power of our words when we release the words of God under the anointing of God from the overflow of his word in our heart. They go out like that stone. They hit the enemy in his ears and they go into his head and it annihilates the enemy's attack. Amen. That's why we have a shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. So you can live a lifetime on that highway of holiness. You know, for example, whenever I buy a car, I speak over it. You're a good car. You'll never let me down. Even the very first car I remember believing God for, I made a prayer list. I put it up next to my bed and I prayed over it. Your tires won't go flat. Your windscreen won't break. You'll never let me down. You will always start and things like that. I prayed for this car. It would have good acceleration. You know, it would always be in tune was part of that first prayer. And every car I've had since then over the last 40 years have all been based on the same prayer and I speak it over them. And so it's the same with our sound equipment. And another one we say all the time is it never rains when we're setting up and packing up. It can rain in between before and after, but it never rains when we're setting up and packing up. And many times we've been driving to ministry knowing that we have to bring equipment in from the car and set it up and it's been raining or threatening rain and we just stay on that one confession. It never rains when we're setting up and packing up because God can watch over it to perform it I'm consistent with it and you've got to be persistent in these things and never let the enemy trick you into saying words that cancel out the law of confession working in your favor. Amen. So speak the word. So what have we learned from these examples? The first one is David, you can build a highway of holiness for your future with your words today. And finally, today, we're going to look at Jesus. Jesus had a lot of things to say about himself. For example, in Mark 10, 32 to 34, Now they're on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Now this is Jesus confession. Remember, it's not necessarily a positive confession of hopium. This is confessing what God says. Jesus put it this way in verse 33. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Amazing. He confessed what God said. If it was just a positive confession, he would have said, I'm going up to Jerusalem. They'll try to arrest me, but they won't. They'll try to spit on me, but they won't. They will try to hold me and whip me, but I'll get away. He didn't do that. He confessed what was going to happen to him. You see, what happened to him didn't happen for his sake. It happened for my sake for your sake. Our sin and our life of independence and rebellion from God was so bad, somebody had to pay for it. And Jesus put up his hand and said, I'll pay for it. And that whipping, spitting, betrayal, mockery, false imprisonment, false trial, and then the murderous act of crucifying an innocent man needed to take place to pay for my sins. It's like, I did the crime, he does the time. I do the crime, he receives the punishment. 
It's totally unfair, it's unreasonable, but it's love in operation. In John chapter 12, 23 to 24, Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And in Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He gave his life. He did it as a ransom payment to pay our debt and to set us free. It is for freedom that you have been made free. And Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You know, his amazing act of love in doing this for us doesn't even lead him to say, now you owe me. He says, now you're free. You're free to choose forgiveness through this amazing act of love and the punishment Jesus suffered, including three days and three nights in the belly of the earth or in hell but we can choose to accept him or reject him. If we choose to accept him, we can receive the forgiveness he paid for. We can receive the new birth he made available to us and the whole of our old life goes out of existence with Jesus when he rose from the dead. We can avail ourselves of that, be born again, start a brand new life today when none of the old track record matters anymore. It's completely gone. It's annihilated in Jesus. And you begin today as a new creation. Remember the original creation started with God saying, let there be light. And it starts today with you saying special words of turning to Jesus, confessing Jesus is Lord and believing that he rose from the dead. And I can lead you in those special words today. And if you receive this and say this prayer, and really mean it to God, your name will be in the Lamb's Book of Life, your name will disappear from the devil's role, and your destiny will no longer be hell, where the devil will be punished eternally. Simply say this prayer after me, say it to God and mean it with all your heart, and receive Jesus as your Saviour. Say this, Jesus, you repeat it. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my old life, I receive your complete washing from sin. I receive your new birth. I believe you rose from the dead. Today, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Saviour. I confess you are my Lord. And I'm going to follow you from this day forward. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you said that prayer today and really meant it, and remember, if you were just watching it, you can always run back through the message and say it again. But if you did say it, then I believe you're born again. I believe that Jesus is now your Lord. He will begin to lead you, direct you. Your part is to keep saying Jesus is Lord. Praise the Lord. Read the Bible if you've got one, and it's easy to download the Bible app. If you don't have it, you can get an audio Bible or a written Bible on your phone. And then pray every day to God and talk to someone that you know is a Christian. Start fellowship and let God guide you to a great group of people, which he calls his church, where you can be growing and learning together with others and really start to be serious about following Jesus. And the first serious step, of course, is to be baptized. If you've confessed Jesus is Lord, his first instruction is be baptized. Being baptized can be done by a believer or in a church. It's where you just simply go into the water dry and come out wet. It symbolizes the burial of your old life and coming back with a new life completely. Jesus killed the old life on the cross with him. But you bury him by faith when you're baptized and saying, I want nothing more to do with that old life. I'm putting it off. I'm putting on this new life and I'm walking in Jesus today. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for listening today. Let's remember to use our tongues to create a highway of holiness, to make a positive confession about what God is saying, that we can take our promised land and God can lead us into it 
and remember to declare over your nation what God's Word says. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I'll see you in the next message. Bye. Well, it's been so good to have you with us today. Remember this week, keep praying for one another. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't let the storms get you. Don't let the worries and anxieties about tomorrow stop you. Focus on Jesus. Keep the Word of God in your eyes and in your ears. Keep it in the center of your heart. Remember, it says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Out of it flows the overflow of the words that can make or break your future. So God bless you. Thanks so much for watching. And until next time, from the Eternity Online Service, this is David and Rosanna saying bye. bye.